Thank you for being here. Today we're going to continue our series on surviving the storms of life. And uh, we've talked about storms for the past couple weeks, and today I'm going to talk about this thought, how storms can make you better. Sometimes God puts us through a storm, not because He's mad at us, not because He's punishing us, but literally because it makes us better. It helps us by going through the storm. Thank you, Chip. And uh, so today we want to talk about that today. So uh, everybody goes through storms. That's inevitable, right? I mean, we all know that. If you've lived long enough, you know that you're going to go through a storm. You're going to go through, and we're talking about metaphorically going through a storm, going through difficulties in life, going through trials in life, uh, going through testings in life. This is a part of life. Now, how you handle the storm will ultimately determine whether you get better or whether you get bitter. And I've seen a lot of people get bitter when they go through difficulties, trials, testings. Uh, but God does not put you through a storm to make you bitter, but he puts you through that to make you better. So today we're going to see how God uses the storm in our lives to make us better. Well, let me just set up uh, the context of what I'm going to read today. Uh, Jesus had just done a miracle. You've heard of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, right? Okay. So Jesus had just done this. In fact, it was 5,000 men, not including women and children. So it was much more than 5,000 people. And so with one little boy's lunch, five loaves of bread, two fish, he fed probably somewhere around 15,000 people, to be honest, uh, is more likely what was in the crowd. An incredible number of people. And so um, as soon as this had happened, is where we pick up our story today in Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 22. You can follow along with me, either follow along on the screen or you can follow along on your smartphone. Uh, you can go to uh, the church uh, center app or you can follow along on the Bible app and uh, read along with us. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 22. Immediately he, that's Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So he's telling them, get into the boat on the water, and they're crossing this giant lake. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, uh, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. How many can say amen there? You ever been uh, where the wind was against you? You ever been in the middle of a storm? You ever been in the middle of difficulty? Man, there have been many times in my life that I felt like the wind was against me. You know, not only am I facing the waves, but it seems like everything that could go wrong does go wrong. You ever been there? Well, the wind was against them. And the fourth watch of the night, that's sometime after 3 a.m., but between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So after the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, them being the disciples, walking on the sea. It's a miracle. Jesus is walking on water. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. I don't blame them. I'd be afraid too. I mean, I'd be like, you know what? This is highly, highly unusual. They were terrified. They said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now I want you to maybe underline that. Think about that little phrase, those couple sentences. He says, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. And Peter, got to love this guy. Sometimes he got his mouth in motion before his brain got in gear. Um, but he was the spokesman for the group. He was 
always ready to, to do something. I like people that are bent toward action, don't you? Now, Peter may not have been the greatest planner in the world, but he always took action. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And i got to call time out here. Because is that really the smartest play? Okay. I mean, if it was a ghost and they, that ghost was trying to destroy them, you wouldn't ask that ghost to tell you to come out onto the water, would you? I know I wouldn't. I'd be like, heck no, I'm not going to do that. But he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And so Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. By the way, we all like the idea of walking on water. Overcoming those obstacles. Achieving things we never thought possible. But none of us likes to get out of the boat. None of us likes to be in the middle of the storm. And you cannot walk on water unless you're willing to get out of the boat. Can I get an amen right there? You know, look, the bottom line is um, this was a test of his faith. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. I I like it that when it came down to it in the middle of his emergency, he didn't try to get all fancy. You ever, be around, you ever been around these people that pray these fancy prayers that you're not sure that they get past the ceiling or not? Our most benevolent and most gracious Heavenly Father, Thou who art the one that has created the universe. That's not what he did. He didn't start trying to use some Elizabethan English. He didn't try to sound all fancy. He didn't try to sound spiritual. You know what he did when he was in trouble, when he was beginning to sink? He said, Lord, save me. That's a pretty good prayer. And you and I in the middle of our storm should be willing to pray that kind of prayer as well. Lord, save me. And and notice how Jesus responds. This shows you the loving heart of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus immediately, immediately. Aren't you glad that we have a Lord, a Savior that is attentive to our needs, that hears us when we pray? He doesn't make us go through this gauntlet spiritually. Now, as soon as you say 14 Hail Marys and you take communion and you do this, this, and this, no, immediately. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him and saying to him, and and this is a puzzling thing to me, because Jesus said to the only other human in history that had actually got out of the boat and walked on water, oh, you of little faith. Are you serious? I would say that Peter had magnificent faith. He had amazing faith. He had enough faith to get out of the boat. Where were the other 11? They were still in the boat. All right, you go, Peter. Go on. Yeah, whoo. Thumbs up. No, they were still in the boat. They didn't have the faith that Peter had. But Jesus said to him, Oh, you of little faith. Why is that? Well, I think he got his eyes off of Jesus and onto the storm. And whenever we get our eyes off of Jesus and onto the storm, our faith is going to be affected. Our faith is going to be diminished. And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Truly, you are the Son of God. Well, What can we glean from this story? Well, I think one is that Jesus knows that storms will come. You you might consider it cruel that Jesus, because he knew that a storm was coming, he sent them out onto the lake. He sent them out onto the sea. He sent them into the middle of the storm. Jesus knew, and he sent them anyway. Why is that? Why would he 
display such disregard for the people that he claimed to love. Well, that's not what he was doing at all. He was actually showing his love. Jesus knows that you're going to go through storms. Jesus knows that life is difficult. Jesus knows that you're going to face challenges. In fact, um, he knows everything about us. He knows everything that we're going to face. He knows everything that we're going to go through. So it doesn't catch Jesus by surprise when we go through storms. It does not catch Jesus by surprise when we uh, face difficulty, okay? Jesus knows that storms will come, but here's the beauty of it. Jesus is always with us during the storm. He knows that storms come, but he's always promised to be with you. This is one of the things that astounds me, and uh, I've talked about this recently. The fact that one of the greatest questions that I'm ever faced with is this. If there is a good and benevolent God, if God is all-powerful and all-loving, why does he allow us to suffer? Why does he allow difficulty? That's a great question. And I would encourage you that you not shy away from that question. God is never bothered by your questions. Um, you might wonder, why have I been selected to go through this? Why have I been forced to face this storm? How is it that I've got this difficulty to go through? Why, God? Well, sometimes we don't get the answer to all those questions till we get to heaven. Um, I, I do believe that uh, oftentimes, uh, we're not going to find satisfactory answers here when we ask the wrong questions. Sometimes why is reserved for later. Sometimes why is reserved for heaven. But I do know this. In spite of the fact that I am going to go through difficulties, in spite of the fact that I am faced with struggles and trials and suffering. There's a good God that loves me. And so maybe the right question is not why, but what? What does God want to teach me? What does God want to show me? What does God want to make out of my life? Have you ever noticed that sometimes the things that we think are the worst things in the world turn out sometimes not to be? They're the things that open a door that never would have been open for us otherwise. They're the things that give us a perspective on life that otherwise we never would have had. I heard about this couple that um, they had prayed their entire marriage to be able to have a baby. They had never been able to get pregnant. Finally, after years and years and years of struggles and years of trying, they got pregnant. And oh, they were so excited. And turns out that they had a son. And this son, it turns out, had not slight, not just on the spectrum, but he had severe autism. And uh, as you can imagine, they struggled with this. They were like, you know, they loved this child. They uh, loved everything about him, but they wondered, God, why did you let us go through this? Well, it turns out they prayed that they would have another child, and they did, and they had a girl. It turns out that this girl also didn't, she wasn't just on the spectrum, but she had severe autism. Well, what most people from the outside would have deemed a tragedy a burden, a challenge. They embrace, they love these children more than life itself. They love these children like God loves us. And even though they thought that this was a trial, even though they thought a difficulty that they really didn't know if they could survive or not, God used this in their life 
And they started a ministry to parents with autistic children. And what ended up being a challenge, a storm, something that they were not planning to face, ended up being the very ministry that God chose for them. And to hear this couple give their testimony, they thank God. They thank God every day for the challenge that caused them to find their ministry, to find what they were put on this earth for. So sometimes the things that we think are challenges or difficulties are actually blessings in disguise. And so whenever you go through difficulty, understand that Jesus knows he will be with you in the storm. He has power over the storm. Don't you love the story? If you read this story in the other Gospels, you find that uh, Jesus was able to calm the storm. He just simply said, peace, be still. Jesus has power over the storms in your life. Jesus also has a purpose for the storm. As I think about this, I'm confident that Peter looked back on this very moment in his life as a turning point in his relationship with God, as a reminder of what God wanted to do with him, as a reminder of the power of God over the storms. I have no doubt that God's purpose was fulfilled by Peter going through the storm. Well, The question then becomes this, how can storms make you better? Now, I told you to remember uh, the two sentences, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. I want to just break that down for a moment and show you how storms, God sends storms into our life to make us better. The little phrase, take heart, here's what it means, and I want you to maybe write this down. It means to be firm or resolute in the face of danger or adverse circumstances. In other words, you're firm. You're resolute. You are, even though there's storms going on around you, you are firm in the face of danger, in the face of adverse circumstances. Let me ask you a question. Whenever you get adverse circumstances, do you want to quit? I'm, if I'm honest... There have been a lot of times I want to quit. Uh, there's kind of a, a saying that goes on among pastors. Pastors never want to quit except for every Monday morning. All right. So, you know, the fact is you're going to be challenged. You're going to be faced with circumstances that are adverse. But what do you do in the face of danger? What do you do when things aren't going your way? That phrase also means this, and this is what I want you to get from it. It means to be courageous. So he said, take heart. You know what he's really saying? Have courage. Be courageous. Don't worry. Oh, we worry, we get sometimes thrown for a loop. But the truth is, you don't have to give in. You can have courage. Why does God let you go through the storm? How can a storm make you better? Well, I want to give you three thoughts and we're done. Number one, God tests me to grow my courage. God wants you to be courageous. God did not create you just to fill some skin for a few years. Now, I realize that all of us have a different... um, if you will, micro purpose. We all have the same macro purpose. Do you know what I mean when I say micro and macro? Uh, The macro purpose is that we are to please God. We are to serve God. That's to be what we do with our life. The micro purpose is the specific thing that God has called you to do. God called me in my micro purpose to be a pastor. He called me to teach and preach the word of God. Okay? He called me to lead. All right? That's my micro purpose. The macro purpose is the same as yours. I'm to bring glory to God with my life. I'm to serve God with my life. And so 
Uh, God wants me to know that I, in my purpose, am to be bold. I am to serve Him. I'm not to be afraid. When Jesus said, it is I, it encourages me to know that God is with me. Now, next week, I'm going to be speaking about how the storms of your life can help others. They help me, they help you, but they also help other people. We're going to look next week at the life of Joseph, the 11th of the 12 sons of Israel. And um, he was an interesting character, and I won't go into all of his story. I'll t- save that for next week. But Joseph, just to give you kind of in a nutshell of what he went through, when he was 17 years old, he was a dreamer. He uh, had these dreams, and his brothers got jealous of him, and they threw him in a pit, and they sold him to slavery. And Joseph, as a 17-year-old boy, he was sold into slavery into Egypt. And the story goes that uh, he, he was sold into Potiphar's house, and uh, Potiphar, he really began to trust him, and Joseph began to be promoted. And then Potiphar's wife, you remember her? She was trying to seduce Joseph. But Joseph said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I, I've got more integrity than that. I'm not going to uh, go against my uh, master in that way. And of course, uh, Potiphar's wife, we'll call her Hotifer, all right? She, she, was, uh, uh, she was very cunning and she was very much set on either getting Joseph to sin with her or ruining him. And she couldn't get him to sin with her. And so what did she do? Well, she set out to ruin him. She accused him of rape, of sexual assault. And of course, Joseph was then thrown from being enslaved to being imprisoned, okay? And yet you'll find that in the scripture, here's what it says. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. And then notice this, he showed him kindness and granted him favor. Are you serious? God, are you saying that you're giving me favor and kindness when you're taking me from my family? And I got, it's bad enough that I was sold into slavery, but now I've been falsely accused and I'm in prison. I'm in prison. Well, I won't tell you the rest of the story, but God used that moment in his life to do something in the life of Joseph that God had destined him for, that God had planned for him. Not only to save himself, but to save the world. you got to have courage. Do you realize how much courage it took for Joseph to stand strong when he had been falsely accused? How much courage it took for him to stand strong when he had been separated from his family? When he had lost everything, he stood strong. God tests us to grow our Courage. Wilma Rudolph was an American sprinter. We just came through the Olympics in Paris, and I love watching the Olympics. But Wilma Rudolph uh, won three gold medals in the 1960 Olympic Games in Rome. And she was celebrated as the fastest woman in the world. Uh, But what most people don't know about her was that when she was... Uh, only a child, about four or five years old, she was diagnosed with polio. Polio. And if you know anything about that disease, you know that that affects you the way you walk, and it affects your strength, and it affects everything about your gait. It, it affects you. And can you imagine the courage that it took for a, a young African-American woman who had been robbed of her ability to walk and to run, can you imagine the determination it took for her, the courage it took from her, not only to keep on trying to walk, but trying to run, and eventually to becoming one of the greatest Olympic champions 
in history. Now, here's what I can say. Her storm grew her courage. And sometimes if you don't get anything else out of a storm, if you can get courage, it's worth the storm. And God will use you if you allow him to grow your courage. Number two, God tests me so I can get to know him better. Jesus said, do not be afraid. And this is the beauty about the storm. It helps me to develop my faith and come, overcome my fear. Now, I alluded to this earlier. Do you imagine with me that Peter, God used him in a great way. Uh, Peter became the leading apostle in the church. Peter became one that started churches, did miracles, raised people from the dead, made crippled people able to walk. God used him in a tremendous... He took the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, God used Peter to write Holy Scripture. Think about this. Do you think that maybe, maybe, just maybe, that Peter looked back on his life? Do you ever think he ever recalled the fact that he was willing to get out of the boat and walk? He sank, but he got out of the boat. He had courage. He had faith. And I do believe that God often will let us go through the storm to get us to know him better. And I can tell you this in my own life. Uh, I, I wish that it was always on the mountaintop experiences that I got to know God best. I wish it was during the wonderful times where you didn't have any stress, you didn't have any problems, you didn't have any doubts. Wouldn't that be great if that's when you got to know God better? I'm not saying you can't know God during those times, but I'm just saying that it's unlikely that you're going to get to know Him best. But it's during the storm that you'll get to know Him. It's during the storm that you'll get to get closer to Him. It's during the storm when you begin to sink that He'll reach out and save you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote about these people. He said, fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to their very limit. But the trial exposed their true colors. You know what God wants to do with you? He wants to expose your true colors. There's something in you greater than what you think. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have more strength, not in your own self, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of God. You have more in you than you even can imagine. You say, why does God let me go through difficulties? Sometimes just so you can get to know him better. And I can promise you that when you do get to know him, the Apostle Paul wrote it this way, is that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. It is in those trials that you get to know him better. And then finally, why does God let us go through the storm? Well, he does it to help me grow my courage. He does it so I can get to know God better. But then he does it so that he can prove his power. And I love this. Remember, Peter walked on water, and he often came back to that. I believe that it increased his confidence in God. And sometimes storms are necessary to prepare us for something bigger. You see, Peter had no clue at this point. He was just not far removed from being a fisherman. Nothing wrong with being a fisherman, honest living. But the truth is, God had something a lot bigger in mind for Peter. He was going to change the world. And Peter had no clue. Um, but he learned that God is with him. Why does God let me go through storms? He does it. He tests me to prove his love. He proves his love for me when I go through difficulty. He proves it. He proves it. Uh, God tests me to help me do what I thought was impossible. You see, the truth is, 
God will use you to do things you didn't think were possible. First time I ever preached, it was a disaster. Okay? Um, I was just a kid. I was 12 years old. And I preached in front of our church on a Wednesday night. And uh, I preached from John 3.16. I'll never forget it. And I, they had given me 10 minutes. Another kid and I were the ones doing this. It was a youth night. And the youth were being the ushers. And the youth were leading the music. They were doing the announcement. They were doing everything that night. And I'll never forget that, you know, as I got up to preach... And I had chosen my text. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And man, I got up there and I was supposed to go for 10 minutes. And after about three minutes, I had run out of stuff to say. And some of you are like, why don't you let some of that rub off on you now, right? So... <laughs> But I, for three minutes, I said everything that I knew to say it, and I was like, oh, no, I'm out, of, I'm out of content, and I got seven minutes left. And so I, what I did was I said, so what that means is, and I said everything that I just said again, <laughs> and then I prayed as long as I could possibly pray. And I preached for seven minutes, never forget it, seven minutes. And I'll never forget how I felt afterwards. I thought, never again will I try that. Never again will I stand up in front of people. Never again will I do that because that was a disaster. But you know, God had something else in mind. And God used that to teach me that with Him, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. He wants to do the same in your life. And then finally, God will test me to empower my worship. Don't you like what it said that they got in the boat and the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Your, your testing will empower your worship. First Peter 1, 7, we're talking about Peter, right? He wrote this. He said, these trials are only to test your faith. I wonder if when he wrote that, he was remembering when he stepped out of the boat. I wonder if he remembered. He was stepping out of the boat and he began to sink. You know, that would be embarrassing, right? I mean, you had enough courage to get out of the boat and you were doing it. You were walking on water, man. Everybody celebrate. Everybody give him that man a hand, right? But then it was colossal public failure. He began to sink. He said, these trials are only to test your faith, and your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. You see, God wants you to worship him. God wants you to know him. God wants you to get better. He wants you to be better. And he has a plan for you. So here's the question. What storms are you facing? I know you're in them. We all have them. Are you allowing the storm to distract or derail you? Boy, that's easy. Man, we can get discouraged. We can get distracted. We can have our plans derailed. Or are you allowing the storm to make you better? Don't let it make you bitter. Let it make you better. By keeping your eyes on Jesus and by seeing him, instead of seeing the effects of the storm, you'll grow in your courage. Your faith will get stronger. You'll experience God's love and his power. And you'll worship him. And God will use you to do more than you ever thought possible. And that is my prayer for you, for me, that God will use the storm to make us better. Heavenly Father, help us today. I know that you love us. You know the storms that we go through, but yet you're with us during the storm. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, uh, to trust that, 
And Lord, I pray that you'd help us today to follow you. Now, before we finish our prayer, I wonder if you don't have Jesus as your Savior, I, want, I, I know this, you'll face the storms of life alone. You won't have anybody to be there with you. And you're going to go through storms, I promise you that. So why don't you turn your life to Him? Trust Him as your Savior. Give Him the reins of your life. Ask Him to save you. You can pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and my sins. And I want to receive you right now. If you'll do that online, mark it at the bottom of the screen in the room. Use the next step card and drop it in the offering in just a moment. But I wonder if you would say, Pastor, I'm facing a storm right now. And I need prayer. And I want you to pray with me that God will help me to be stronger. To trust Him during my storm. Would you just raise your hand anybody like that in the room today? Let's pray about this right now. Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you during the storm. We all face them, but help us to know that you're with us. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, um, I'm going to ask our ushers to come. And if you're uh, one of the ones that's filled out the next step card, maybe you have a prayer request. Maybe you want to go to the next step class. Maybe you want to uh, serve in a ministry. Particularly, listen, this is very important. If you want to be involved in a small group, okay, use that. And if the bucket's already passed by the time you uh, got around to filling that out, just bring it and set it up here on this after the service. Or better yet, go see Wendy. Uh, there will be somebody over here uh, to help you with the prayer team. They'll be here to pray with you, and you can give them that. And we'll follow up with you this week so you can be involved in a small group, okay? Well, it's great to see you all today. I'm so glad that you came. And uh, now next week, we will have our Next Step class, and we're going to offer it after both services. And I realize we kind of spread out over two services, but I want to give people the opportunity uh, to take that next step. If you'd like to be a part of that, the next Sunday after both services, we'll have our Next Step class, okay? All right, let's everyone stand. Thank you for being here today. I love you. God bless you for being here today. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.